Hello, a very warm welcome to this webinar, Isolation of the Operatory Field in Times of COVID-19. Dear colleagues and friends, in these times, we're really facing big challenges in our offices. Uh, and the question is, how can we protect ourselves and how can we protect our personnel, our dental personnel in the clinic and our uh, patients as well? So today, we talk about all this, but of course, we will focus on the isolation of the operatory field. But then on a side note, I also would like to give you some um, recommendations, what, we, what else we can do to, to protect ourselves and our environment. Good. To make the whole thing a bit less boring, I would like to make this um, as interactive as I can, because we are so many people here all, o all around the world. Um, you are all muted with a microphone, but of course you can still interact with me by questions. How do you do this? So once we, you have your questions in mind, it probably makes sense to, to wait. <laughs> Maybe I'm already answering uh, most of them. However, you see this panel probably on the right side of your screen where you can see a little field here where you can submit your text questions. And at the end of the webinar, I will do my utmost to answer the questions, your questions that you're actually um, submitting to me now. Okay, so on top of this, I will also ask you questions. So we will do some surveys here in this webinar, and uh, you can easily answer those surveys by just clicking on your screen. And then we can all see um, what you have answered. Uh, of course, this is completely anonymous, so nobody can see who is answering what, and also I cannot see who is answering what, but it's good uh, to be a bit more interactive. Okay, ready? Then I just would like to show you where I am now. This is a view on the Avoclar Vivident Company, which is situated in the heart of Europe in the Principality of Liechtenstein. And you can see uh, the most modern building here, is, is this one here. This is the uh, so-called ICDE, International Center for Dental Education. That's where I'm broadcasting now. And this is where um, we do our trainings. So um, this is the team Global Education Clinical, myself and four other dentists and three uh, dental assistants. Usually you come here to Liechtenstein and we do some hands-on courses together. However, in these difficult times, of course, we do everything online. So I really hope that we can do uh, these courses again soon and maybe welcome many of you here in Liechtenstein. Uh, on top of this, I'm also a dentist just like you in a private clinic uh, in Switzerland, which is not far away from here. It's about uh, three and a half kilometers just across the Rhine River and I'm in, in a different country. Good. So let's jump into the topic. The necessity for a uh, for really effective isolation is there. Why? Uh, first of all, to really get good access and retraction, uh, because we need to uh, exposure the, the operator field, which is the mouth of the patient, uh, in order to retract the lips and the cheeks and the tongue so that we can really uh, efficiently work in a, in a good environment. That brings you to the next uh, Point, moisture control is important. Really need to, to have a dry working field, which is free of saliva, blood, and sulcus fluid. And then um, the third uh, part here is, of course, the protection. That means protection of the patient in the first place, to protect him from hazardous substances, aspiration, swallowing. And then you can see the last point is aerosols. So we want to protect the patient from aerosol, but we also need to protect ourselves from the patient's aerosols. So this will be uh, a topic also of today because um, we're talking about the difficult situation with COVID-19, as you know. Good. Okay. Then, of course, we can uh, distinguish between two types of isolation. One is the relative isolation. You can see with the cotton rolls and suction, just a conventional way. And then we also have absolute isolation or total isolation where we apply, for example, a rubber dam. So um, we can keep everything completely dry. And I would like to also um, show you some study results. What is the difference be between the two of them? Okay, so I would like to give you an overview 
uh, of what we are talking about today. So um, I have actually structured this webinar in three different parts. First of all, relative isolation. I would like to give you some new technologies here, what we have available. Then we talk about absolute isolation. Also here, uh, we have some new developments here. And then, of course, I would like to show you clinical application tips and tricks, what we can do here uh, to make our lives easier and more effective. So we start with the first part, which is relative isolation. I think we all know, and it's not a big deal, right, to, to use uh, cotton rolls and suction and everything. Uh, but then it is not guaranteed that you have very good access also to the patient's mouth. So you also need your assistant or assistants <laughs> to hold the cheeks away with the, with the mirrors. And here, um, there's something new, which I would like to show you. It's actually not so new, but maybe new to some of you, which is called the Optra Gate. And it's actually a tool for perioral retraction of cheeks and lips. And so you get really, really good access to the patient's mouth. Uh, you actually don't need somebody to hold the cheeks away with a mirror. What's also very good, it's three-dimensionally flexible. So it is, uh, offers a high patient comfort and uh, it's actually supporting uh, the opening of the mouth uh, by the patient. So in uh, times of COVID-19, one of the advantages is that you have this um, hygienically single packaged. That means uh, you, you take it away and it's clean, right? So that's really good. It's also latex free. So it's also suitable for patients with allergies and it offers a very wide range of application as you can see here. So it doesn't matter if you if you do a checkup, if you want to do direct uh, restorations or indirect restorations, yeah. When you take a, an impression here, that's very uh, elegant here because um, your assistant can focus on the mixing and the delivery of the tray and impression material rather than dealing with the lips, right? Uh, and the cheeks, because that is already done by the Optra gate. And in orthodontics, it's good, uh, professional care, bleaching procedures. Uh, today we talk about uh, digital dentistry, so you need to do scanning. So for scanning, you need to have very good access so that you can scan all the areas that you need. And uh, finally, even for, for children in pediatric dentistry, uh, it is very helpful because it, it will help to break the ice, right? To, to keep the, 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 the children uh, more relaxed because they can focus on the new tool that you can play around with it because it's available in blue or in pink. So you can kind of uh, divert the child away from the fear that they maybe have when you're sitting in front of you. <laughs> okay, so um, the Optra Gate here, of course, uh, offers a lot of uh, advantages also in terms of the efficiency because you, you can actually, yeah, focus on the, the treatment rather than uh, of uh, gaining, um, gaining access. That's already done by the Optra Gate. So some people said it's like having an additional assistant without obstructing the view. You simply have less instruments and hands in the patient's mouth. Let me show you how this works. Uh, you can see um, this is applied in two ways. So there's, uh, you, you insert it in the, in, the, in the patient's lip on the sides and the angles, and then you just uh, push the inner ring um, behind the patient's upper lip. And then, so this is done extremely slowly, right? So you can see how the inner ring is sliding behind the patient's upper lip. And the same thing is done with the lower lip. So if I do this in real time, I can apply this in about two or three seconds. So it's just like tuck, 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 and it's, it's already done. So this is a quick procedure where you don't lose any time. And um, of course, it comes in three different sizes, the regular one, mostly men and small one a lot of women have this and then uh, of course for children you would have a junior size the question is how do you fit the sizes how do you find out which size fits for which patient and you can see on the package on the upper on the um, back side of the packaging you have kind of a gauge here 
And with the help of this gauge, which is always measured from one corner of the mouth to the other one, you can select the appropriate size. So for example, this is a woman, an adult woman, and you can see here, from here to here, that would be her size, so this would be a small size. And then you can see the, the junior size is, is smaller, whereas the regular size is larger, okay? So this can be done at a glance, and of course, uh, I think the assistant will already um, do this. Um, and for the same patient, you will actually put a note and say, okay, for future visits, um, that lady would require a small size. Okay. Um, interesting is that the Optrogate has made it to the media, um, like like this gentleman here. So you can see, he's actually uh, modif moderating this with the Optrogate in place. And this works, right? Because the, he can still talk, maybe not so clear. However, it's possible to communicate still with the patient and it doesn't in it does not really um interfere with a bite so if you want to if you take a bite it is possible with the ultra gate in place all right good so now let's come to the absolute isolation and uh, of course um it is uh, nothing new because the the rubber dam has been introduced more than 150 years ago you can see here 1864 by a New York dentist called Sanford Barnum. So he introduced this um, to his colleagues in New York because he had already the vision of having a complete uh, dry working field to improve the quality. So this was his, uh, his idea anyway. And then uh, over the years, um, the rubber dam has been refined with all the clams and, and everything. And um, I would like to uh, ask you, a question. So we come to the first um, survey to use rubber dam for isolation. Yes, regularly, occasionally or not. You can see now 29% um, said yes, I'm using uh, rubber dam regularly and 52 said occasionally and about 19% said they would not use uh, rubber dam at all. Okay, so we know from surveys among dentists globally that about 80 to 85% will not use rubber dam. So obviously you are using rubber dam much more often than um, dentists do actually worldwide. Okay, but that's good. So um, I would then uh, go on with the presentation and uh, talk about the advantages of the absolute isolation, that means with a rubber dam. So first of all, of course, the dry operatory field is something that we need to, to especially when you think of adhesive procedures. Then um, it's very good to, to protect the patient from aspiration, ingestion control. Same applies to aerosol and contamination. Um, the question is, do we save time with it or do we waste time with it? That is the question, right? Do we reduce operative time or do we increase the operative time? And what about the stress level? So these are some of the questions that I would like to answer with you, uh, answer to you with the help of, uh, let's say, recent studies also. So some of them are, of course, my own opinion, but I would like to uh, present you this in a more scientific uh, style. So you can see all those topics here, influence of rubber dam use on longevity, of the restoration of the root canal treatment on aspiration, on aerosol control, on operative time, and also on patient acceptance. Because at the end of the day, it's also important what the patient think of our treatment, right? Is it good or is it not so good or do they reject it? So, okay, so let's, let's jump into our first um, question here. What is the influence of rubber dam on longevity of uh, direct restorations? I will answer this in a minute, but if you think of what kind of restorations we're doing today, so most of them will be adhesive restorations. We want to do adhesive dentistry, aesthetic dentistry. So all of these things is based on the perfect adhesion when we apply the bonding agent. And so that is a very critical step that is very um, critical in terms of contamination contamination in terms of saliva, yeah? So for example, when you have a contamination with saliva, blood or sulcus fluid, you can actually uh, really 
uh, expect very poor adhesive performance. Even if you have the latest, most expensive bonding agent, but even those products, advanced products, they will not perform if you apply it on a contaminated uh, tooth that is swimming in the sea of saliva, of course. Um, but if you look at the literature, I mean, there are a lot of studies uh, looking at the, let's say, outcome of direct restorations when we compare total isolation to relative isolation with cotton rolls and suction. And you can see all these studies that you see here uh, has no influence. There's no difference, right? So, of course, when you have a total isolation, you have the best possible condition to do good dentistry, right? But then it's also possible to have a perfect uh, cotton roll isolation. So if you exchange, exchange those frequently, you have perfect suction, you have very good assistant, then of course you can also achieve a very, very good result long-term. So, and you can see proper isolation is the key. It's, it's more important than the method of isolation. And then, however, but there's not much evidence uh, to really show that uh, rubber dam isolation is really, really significantly better. There's one study, it's actually a review, and they found some low quality evidence that rubber dam usage in dental direct restorative treatments may lead to a lower failure rate of the restorations compared to cotton roll usage. But they, they clearly say that the further high quality research to evaluate this question is necessary. So this is not really, really uh, very significant and very strong evidence to support this. So you can always get good, good results if you really uh, do good uh, relative isolation as well. So, but there's one uh, German professor and uh, he quoted it like this, is rubber dam use always necessary? He said, rubber dam use is not necessarily the equivalent to good dentistry, but it's much easier to practice good dentistry under the condition of total isolation. Of course, because once you have your rubber dam in place, you don't need to worry. You don't need to, to be concentrated if you have a contamination, which you have with uh, a relative isolation, because you have to constantly uh, change cotton rolls and be careful that the patient is not doing with something with the tongue and so on. Good. Okay, what about the uh, rubber dam usage, the influence on the longevity of root canal treatment? I also would like to, to show you here uh, some, some studies. That's one here is um, from China, as you can see here. And it's, it's a clear, a very clear um, conclusion here that the use of a rubber dam during root canal treatment could provide a significantly higher survival rate. So rubber dam usage improves the outcomes of endodontic treatments. It's just one of the studies because this is not very uh, unique, that study, it's, it's, it's very uniform that, that we should actually use rubber dam for all endodontic treatments. And so you can see um, this is also the conclusion or recommendation of all the endodontic societies worldwide. You can see here the one from Germany that they said uh, um, isolation with rubber dam should appear or should be done in every um, root canal treatment uh, session. And the uh, European Society of Endodontology also said in their quality guidelines that uh, the tooth should be always, or root canal treatment should be always done under uh, rubber dam isolation. And why? To prevent salivary bacterial contamination, to prevent inhalation, ingestion of instruments, and also to protect uh, the patient from irrigating solutions, such as sodium hypochlorite. Okay, so this is very clear. Another thing, this is the uh, American Association of Endodontists that also has stated tooth isolation using dental dam is the standard of care. So this is really the standard of care. Um, and then the question is, are dentists following this? Are dentists using rubber dam for endodontic treatment? And this is a study now um, from the US to see, to check the reality. And they, they actually found out that only 47% of uh, general dentists are using rubber dam for, for root canal treatment, uh, which is less than half. <laughs> so uh, in other words, this is not consistent with the recommendation of the American Association of Endodontists. But there might be reasons for this, why dentists are hesitating to 
to not use a rubber dam. I come back to this a little bit later on, what might be the obstacles to really use a rubber dam. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to aspiration ingestion control, I hope you have never experienced this uh, by yourself uh, when the patient needs to be rushed to the emergency uh, hospital because there is a like an endodontic file hanging here or even in the lungs uh, because of inhalation. Uh, so this is something very, very, very serious and it, it can easily bring you into very big trouble um, with a patient um, and with a law. So um, standard of care is to use a rubber dam um, to prevent also um, problems like this, which could be very costly for you. Okay, uh, otherwise um, I use always a rubber dam for cases like this when I need to exchange, um, for example, amalgams. Uh, you have little pieces here that the patient could inhale or could swallow. Uh, but anytime you're using irrigating solutions, which might be aggressive, irritant substances, and so on, it's always smart to, to use a rubber dam to protect the patient, from, in my opinion. Good. And you protect ourselves also, let's say, medical, legally. Let's put it like this. Good. All right. Um, now we come to, to the question of uh, aerosol control, aerosol or infection control. Um, which is applicable always because we always have to deal with bacteria and viruses and all the bad stuff. But in times of uh, COVID-19, this becomes even more significant. All right, so let's have a look. What, what do we know uh, about this? But first of all, I would like to ask you another question. Are you ready? Ready for this? My question is, what do you think? It's just guessing. Who faces the greatest coronavirus risk? Only 2% said it's the garbage collectors, 2% said it's flight attendants, 14% it's nurses, yeah? Nurses, yes, that's also high, uh, critical, but 83 said it's dentists. And then uh, you're completely right. So um, thank you very much for answering also this question. And I would like to show you um, uh, um, what, what has been published in the New York Times. Uh, and you can see here uh, on, the, on the vertical scale, you can see the exposure to the disease. So that means how many probability of sick people will you meet? And the other one is the physical proximity to, to uh, potentially infected people. And you can see on the on the far out on the right, that's where you can see dentists, yeah. And dentists, of course, that will include uh, dentists and all the dental assistants and everybody who's working with you in the clinic, except for the receptionist who has a little bit further distance and is maybe not directly subjected to the aerosol. But ever uh, whoever is in the treatment in the operatory room has that kind of risk. So we are, are at high risk. And if you, if you look at just um, the, the treatments that we are doing, um, is generating either droplets that, that is actually less than five micrometers in diameter, or it could be aerosols. Uh, so droplets, of course, they play a, also a role when you have very uh, close proximity. And aerosols, uh, if you're even at, at a further distance, as you know, they can travel and they can keep uh, their, their stay there for a certain time also uh, in the air. So there is a high risk um, if we are subjected to this at a high concentration that we will actually breathe in uh, the uh, viral load, let's put it like this, of, of the uh, aerosol. So, and then of course, you also have this one here that we have uh, formite transmission. That means you have infectious material on inanimate objects. That's why we are, should uh, always uh, wash our hands and clean the surfaces. However, uh, the aerosol, that's one of the predominant, uh, uh, more dangerous um, ways of transmission. And you can see here, um, so SARS-CoV-2, which is the coronavirus spreads primarily throughout droplets in aerosols of saliva, and of course, also from discharge from the nose. 
And it's it's just an amazing figure here. I mean, the one mil one only one milliliter of saliva can contain more than one million of viral particles. So that is uh, <laughs> it's it's a it's strong strong number, right? So uh, it's always a good idea to uh, to kind of uh, do measures or take measures uh, to keep that risk uh, at a minimum level. And then, of course, the question is, um, do we need to, or what, what about the uh, pre-procedural or pre-operative antiseptic mouth rinses? Uh, does it make sense? Because the goal is, of course, to reduce uh, the virus, the viral load, SARS-CoV-2 load in aerosols and droplets. And um, in the meantime, there are uh, a, a couple of uh, papers that are recommending to you uh, antiseptic mouth rinses before you start the treatment. And also a lot of uh, dental societies uh, are recommending or have certain recommendations. Now, the problem is we there are a lot of studies of mouth rinses available, but they have all investigated uh, the effectiveness about, let's say most of the time about uh, bacteria, for example, right? Uh, so they, they have been discussed in the context of how can we uh, kind of um, support uh, periodontal treatment? How can we arrest caries? You know, how can we control the caries risk and this kind of thing? But there's not much around in terms of checking the efficacy regarding SARS-CoV-2. So because the, the, the topic is just too brand new. So from this paper that I showed you now, uh, the general recommendation would be to gently gargle for 30 seconds in the oral cavity and 30 seconds in the back of the throat with either 1 to 3% hydrogen peroxide or 0 0.2 to 0.5% povidone iodine or 0.12% of chlorhexidine gluconate or chlor chlorhexidine rinse or 0.05 cetyl pyridinium chloride. So all of these are antibacterial, but the question is how much virucidal are there? And not only virucidal against uh, influenza viruses, uh, but we want to know uh, about the coronavirus. And if you uh, deep a little bit deeper into the subject, but as I said, there are uh, almost no controlled clinically clinical studies. So most of them are all in vitro studies. Uh, so you look at uh, something like this, you can see here, um, when we look at the efficiency of uh, or efficacy of hydro, hydrogen peroxide against uh, SARS-CoV-19, so it's minimal, minimal viricidal activity of hydrogen peroxide, even though a lot of uh, dental associations are recommending this. If you look at povidone iodine, uh, you can see this is much more uh, um, efficient to kill it, so much more uh, active. So this this is uh, probably uh, actually povidone iodine is is one of the material of, of the um, substances that are really that really can kill SARS-CoV-2. Now if you look at chlorhexidine, uh, the picture looks different. If you take a very low a very low concentration, that means really even lower than uh, 0 0.5 uh, percent, you have actually no efficacy. But then uh, a recent study from Yoon from Korea showed actually that uh, if you have a 0 0.1 or 0.12 percent of chlorhexidine, that will kill or inactivate the, the, the coronavirus load for two hours. So, um, so that could be interesting in the in the office. Patient comes in, he's he's gargling with chlorhexidine, and then um, if if your session is not not more than two hours, that should be fine. So um, this is another study, and this one here is a clinical study. So this one is a clinical study that is not yet published. It has just been published as a preprint. Um, they they concluded that it was observed that uh, CPC and uh, polyvidone iodine mouth rinses have sustained effect in reducing viral load in saliva compared to water control. So they had used uh, water as a control, of course. And we observed highly varied efficacy of uh, chlorhexidine mouth rinse also. So highly varied means the low concentration did not work, but the higher concentration of uh, chlorhexidine uh, did work. So I would like to rephrase the recommendation of what you have seen before. Um, a more refined recommendation as I see it now um, fighting through the literature. 
so I would say that povidone, iodine, and uh, cetal pyridine chloride, both of them are very, very effective. Um, saying this is that there's not much clinical controlled evidence anyway available, but what from the data that I see, uh, those two. And then uh, number three in place would be, for example, also chlorhexidine. Uh, when you have at least a 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.12, uh, which is very good. Uh, I'm more critical regarding hydrogen peroxide because it has been shown in a few studies now that this is not uh, adequately um, uh, efficient. So um, restrictions for the recommendation would be uh, some of the iodine products uh, have a possibility to discolor restorations. Uh, re restorations and teeth, and they also have a certain allergenic potential. Povidone is not recommended for pregnant patients or with active thyroid disease. Then uh, regarding chlorhexidine, uh, you should uh, aim at at least 1% of concentration. And then, uh, but of course, as you know, with most of these materials, uh, long-term application may lead to discolorations. And with uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, only minimal vir viricidal activity against SARS-CoV-2 has been observed. And in, in addition, is it has a very, very unpleasant taste. So it's it's not uh, big fun for, for the patients to gargle with it. Arboclar is offering a chlorhexidine mouth rinse, also with a 0.1% chlorhexidine concentration. In addition, it contains xylitol, which is... Um, um, bacteriostatic, as you know, and for soothing the, the gums uh, and the soft tissues, it contains provitamin D panthenol. It's completely alcohol free and has a very pleasant, mild mint taste. So they don't reject it, they really like it, just as an alternative. Good. Now, when it comes to rubber dam as a barrier, for example, uh, for the aerosol to, to confine the aerosol, um, most of the studies so far have been done with previous, um, let's say, infectious diseases. We still have them, like AIDS and hepatitis or HIV, hepatitis. We still have them, but they're not so in focus anymore. But it has been already sh shown with those older studies that the rubber dam plays a very good role in, in the contention of, of these aerosols. So this is quite good. Now, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, or COVID-19, um, it has been now, we have a few papers here that shows quite good uh, results. That particular study that you see here is actually from Hubei province. Dr. Peng and his group, they stated actually that rubber dam use can really significantly minimize the production of saliva and blood contaminated aerosol or spatter, particularly in, pace, in cases when high speed handpieces and dental ultrasonic devices are used. Another study uh, showed that significant reduction in microorganisms generally of 99% with the use of rubber dam. So they also said that the rubber dam is an excellent barrier to the potential spread of infectious diseases in the dental office. And another study showed up to 70% of reduction of airborne particles, which is aerosol, around a three foot diameter of the operatory field when a rubber dam was used. So that means that also uh, the assistant, which is not directly sitting beside you with the patient, also is uh, enjoying quite a good um, protection against aerosol. So um, generally, uh, the FDI is recommending, your FDI means the World Dental Federation is, is um, recommending the following. As an oral professional, you are invited to refer to your own national dental association to obtain specific and up-to-date guidance in your own context. That means in your own practice. What concrete measures you should do in your own setting, in your own uh, practice. And uh, because I, I'm practicing in Switzerland, I need to check what my own uh, dental association is, is uh, recommending. And this is the so-called Swiss Dental Association, SSO. So they have uh, different papers. They're always kind of updating this. And they said, of course, this is in German. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm translating this for you. They're recommending a treatment with rubber dam whenever possible whenever possible um, to confine the aerosol. So this is, this is one of those things. 
Um, so of course it makes sense if you if you're picking a rubber dam that is already hygienic single packaged so that you don't need to disinfect or something to do with those uh, rubber dam sheets before you apply because there would be an additional working step that is not necessary. Good. So let's have a look on the operative time because obviously there is a reason why only roughly 20% of you uh, or why 20% of you are not using a rubber dam and uh, some dentists complain about that this will take too long time and they will, it will kind of cost you too much money because time is money, that's why. How long do you think it takes to apply rubber dam? Less than two minutes, two to five minutes, five to 10 minutes or more than 10 minutes? 39% of you said it's uh, less than two minutes. So you are very optimistic or you are very, very uh, experienced rubber dam applicator, <laughs> so to speak. Then um, half of you said five to 10 minutes, 7% said 10 to 15 and 3% more than 15 minutes. So the study here in this case uh, compared uh, different rubber dams and this one here is called OptraDam Plus and that one has been placed in 115 seconds and that is uh, an average of different dentists, about five or six dentists applied this many, many, many times, different systems. And so 115 seconds is less than two minutes. And this was actually the isolation of a molar, a lower and upper molar uh, with a metal clamp. So that's that was the overall thing. And you can see one or two minutes and the rubber dam here in this case did not significantly prolong the treatment time in this case. But generally, what do you think is the effect on the overall treatment time? Is it increasing the operative time or time saving or there is uh, no effect? 30% it's increasing the operative time. That's the fear of many dentists that is really increasing the operative time. So in other words, they're losing money. And if this is the case, it's not so good. Uh, 62 said it's actually the opposite. It's time saving and about 8% said uh, there's no difference. It's saving time because the patient cannot rinse, he can, cannot cough, cannot, I don't know, talk about the last holiday. And, you know, when you want to do the procedure, you want to be straightforward. And if the rubber dam is in place, the patient is just quiet <laughs> and, is, um, and, and, and lets the, the treatment done, be done. Yeah. So you can see in uh, Gordon Christensen, um, uh, stated in the, in the Journal of American Dental Association already in nine, back in 94 that uh, with a rubber dam, uh, procedure time is significantly reduced because of the reasons that I already explained. So he's estimating time savings of up to 50% on many clinical procedures. If you are a little bit experienced, a little bit of, of training of rubber dam, uh, then you can apply this very, very quickly. And all the steps beforehand, preparation can be done by the assistant. So even maybe the assistant can even uh, apply it. But anyway, it can be done quickly. Let's have a look. This is a German survey among uh, German dentists asking them, why don't you regularly use rubber dam for composite fillings or adhesively looted uh, indirect restorations? And you can see some of those answers are very interesting. 32% said it's not necessary. 18% said it takes too long. 15% too expensive. 12% said patient rejects. And 10% said it's too complicated. And I agree, uh, some of the rubber dams that are on the market are a little bit complicated. But uh, the question is patient rejects. 12% said patient rejects. I've never, experienced in my whole uh, dental life that the patient really rejects a rubber dam. Because when you explain the patient what you're doing and what's a benefit for him, nobody will reject it. They will even, it's the, the opposite, right? They will demand it. So let's answer this question, patient acceptance, that's important. And some older studies already uh, stated that uh, significant patient relaxation, high acceptance by patients, patients with positive rubber dam experience. Some patients even prefer rubber dam at the next appointment after they have done, a, uh, they have experienced um, that it was good. 
Uh, and you can see very, very strong numbers. Uh, this one is a more recent one study. The, here, the majority of patients, um, more than 61%, reported the use of rubber dam as comfortable and or pleasant. So it's not only okay, but it's comfortable and pleasant. So it's good. However, uh, and this is really important, dentists should spend time needed to explain the importance, the safety and effectiveness of rubber dam use with their patients. And you can use this as a selling point because you can show that you are different, that you take ultimate care for the patient, not only for the quality, but nowadays you have this opportunity to tell the patient, we take extra measure in this practice to protect you from COVID-19. So this is something that you should use. You can win patients with this. Good. It has also been investigated in another uh, study. What is the effect of rubber dam on the stress level of both operators and patients? And also here, with the isolation of the rubber dam, it caused less stress in children, adolescents, compared to relative isolation with cotton rolls. And of course, uh, the treatment time was 12% less for those uh, fissure ceilings. So it was a time benefit also. Good. So, but generally, patients' attitude towards rubber dam is very, very positive, maybe more positive than we think it is. Still, there is a problem with some uh, conventional rubber dams. Why? Because a rubber dam is a two-dimensional sheet, okay? Just like this face mask. Originally, it's two-dimensional, right? It's flat. When you want to put it in the, into the patient's mouth, which I will not do with this mask, obviously, but with a rubber dam, uh, then it, it creates a problem. Why? Because the patient's mouth is three-dimensional. So a two-dimensional tool applied on a three-dimensional mouth, that causes tension, outward tension. And that's why it's so difficult to place a rubber dam in the patient's mouth. So we always need to use clamps. And so um, you can see this outward tension that we have with this rubber dam, conventional rubber dam. And that brings me to the last um, point or the last section of this webinar, which is the clinical application. Because also with the total isolation, we have a new development here. You can see on the left side, we talk about the ultra gate, which is perioral retraction. But then with the Optra Dam plus the, the rubber dam, we have perioral retraction plus absolute isolation. So both of these products are based on two flexible plastic rings, uh, which are connected to each other. Okay. And the Optra Dam here offers also three-dimensional flexibility, and that is actually reducing the outward tension of the conventional rubber dam. So you can easily place this by one person. The frame is already integrated, so you don't need to use these uh, metal frames. So the frame is already here. The outside ring is replacing the additional frame. So the frame is already integrated. Then you can uh, completely isolate both arches simultaneously, which is an, uh, very good. You get very good access. Clamps are not needed in many cases. So you only need a clamp in the posterior molar region, and that's it. You don't need it for anteriors, and then very often you also don't need it for premolars. So what's the basic difference between the Optra dam and the conventional rubber dam is that you have a gentle vertical tension. So that's what you want, because you want to actually place the rubber dam over the tooth, and then the whole thing is pulled into the sulcus here because of that vertical, gentle vertical tension. And you don't have that outward tension that you normally have. So this, this is, of course, easier uh, to keep, to, to apply the rubber dam, to optra, optra dam, and to keep it in place. And an additional plus is um, it has increased patient comfort because it's actually supporting the mouth opening of the patient. So very often I get the feedback that after a longer period of uh, maybe an endodontic treatment, they said, hey, it's very good. It's, very, it's much better than before because I don't have to open the mouth actively. And then there is also a reduced need for clamps. You can see here, this is an anterior isolation where you, 
you don't need any clamp, it's not necessary. If you would like to use a clamp, of course that's possible, but it's not necessary. And also for the post here, you can see even without a clamp here, it's just, but of course I recommend a clamp, but even without a clamp, you can see how that this optrodem is pulled towards the sulcus and that's an advantage. Now in times of COVID-19, um, when we talk about aerosol control, you can see we have a perioral seal. So the we have the inner ring, which is behind the lip. So that seals the inside of the mouth. But then you can see the whole mouth is also periorally sealed by the external by the external ring. And that offers effective aerosol control. Now I would like to show you a clinical case here. Patient comes in. And I would like, I'm quickly explaining the advantage of the Optradam Plus to the patient and the benefits that he gets from it. You can see how flexible it is, the two rings. And um, of course, the size needs to be uh, determined, but that can also be done by the assistant beforehand. And then the next step would be uh, to punch holes into the Optradam Plus. You can see it's already pre stamped, you don't need to stamp it. So that's the upper jaw lower jaw and then you just select the right size of that uh, puncher a hole puncher uh, and then you can see those those equipment here you don't need for the um, let's see the, the frame is not necessary for the Optra dam. then of course uh, after having selected the right size I recommend that we uh, pre uh, punch the hole with the correct uh, with the correct size in this case, it would be a lower molar. I just you just punch that hole inside. You can also isolate more teeth if if you want to do that. Easily done. And then I'm recommending to pre-mount the clamp before you apply the option dam. So you're actually hanging in those um, wings of of the clamp, and then you grab the inner ring here with the uh, with your right hand or the left hand. Uh, with three fingers, right? You can you can just uh, compress that ring, so you have this uh, two little wings here, kind of wings, and those wings go into the corner of the patient's mouth. Let me show you how to do this. You can see I hold it, I put it in one corner, and then on the contralateral corner, and now the patient is slightly closing, and I can now push the inner ring behind the upper and lower lip. So this can be done within a few seconds, within a few seconds. Now you grab the clamp and just pull it or place it over the tooth that you need to isolate. After that, those, you can see now uh, the the dam is, is uh, it still hangs over that wing. So you take a spatula and push it over down and that's it. So likewise, we can do this uh, an anterior isolation. We grab the inner ring, we put it into the corners of the mouth of the patient, and we place that inner ring behind the patient's upper lip and lower lip. That's it. Okay. Now, of course, you need to you need to uh, push the rubber dam over the contact points. You can do this with the help of uh, floss. I would recommend waxed floss just to quickly go over the contact point. The dental assistant can do this. Uh, if you need to have additional ligatures, that's also no problem. If you wanna, let's say, have a more deeper isolation in the cervical area, you can use ligatures, but you can also you know, fix this with some wet jets, or do you know the inversion technique? This is how it how it works like this. So after application of the optradam, you can invert uh, the cervical uh, area, uh, or and you just invert this um, with a spatula and maybe a little bit of compressed air. So now you can see um, here it is not inverted. And here it is inverted, right? Without any ligature. So this can be done very quickly. If you need to have a ligature, you can always combine it with that. So what I want to say is, um, in many cases, you just apply it and you put it, push it over, and that's it. For example, if you want to do a class three or a class four, you don't need to do any ligature because you're way above that 
that cervical area. But of course, when you want to do a class five restoration, then you can either do an inversion like you can see here or here, or if you want to go a little bit deeper, then uh, you can do a, a quick ligature with, uh, with some floss. Okay, cool. So uh, to conclude here, um, um, for the anterior maybe, and uh, definitely for the anterior, you don't need a clamp. And for premolars, usually I, never, I also don't use a clamp. And then for the posterior, for the molar area, I would use then one clamp. You don't need an, another clamp here, uh, but uh, for the posterior, that's it. So it, it's very easy. Some, some patients, they ask, okay, but actually I'm uh, breathing through the mouth and not through the nose. What can we do? You can just cut a hole in here, right? You can cut a hole just in here and then the patient can actually breathe through this hole. And in addition, you can also have some suction or maybe put a small suction in there once in a while. Uh, the removal uh, of the clamp is also very easy. Right, you remove the clamp and then you just make sure that you cut the septums here, that you don't have any splashing when you remove, um, when you want to go back to the contact point, so that you have a very clean uh, removal of the of the optra dam. Likewise, uh, of course, you need to uh, remove uh, the ligatures and the, the wedgets and everything. And also just uh, cut the septums here quickly so that you don't have a messy situation when you apply when you remove the optradam. Okay, I recommend usually this uh, wedge and um, this um, papers here, and that's it. So it's it's a very clean uh, way of removing the optradam. But you can see it can be applied in a very fast way. Good. So the I would like to conclude today's webinar. Uh, we learned that the isolation impacts the quality of restoration and is mandatory. However, um, there is no significant difference between isolation types to achieve high quality restorations. In other words, uh, if you use a rubber dam, in my opinion, it's in many cases easier to use. But if you, if you prefer cotton rolls and suction, um, this also works. If you are really, really careful that you don't have a contamination and the optra gate does help you uh, with the um, relative isolation. That's a good alternative, as you can see here. Then uh, rubber dam uh, has been shown uh, to provide the highest level of aerosol control. So in times of, um, of infection generally, but also today in COVID-19 times, um, this is a very, very good tool. And you, you, you see that the rubber dam is well accepted once you, you explain the benefits and today, patients, they want to seek safety when they go anywhere. But when they go to the dentist, they want to feel safe. And if you can show them what you do in addition, keep them safe in your office, you are the winner. You are definitely the winner because they, they can really see how you, you really care for them. And then your Optra Dam Plus uh, is very easy and fast to apply and it can be used uh, without clamps in the anterior segment, at least. Um, I also don't use it in the, in the premolar area. Definitely, Optradam Plus is an effective aerosol barrier, and that's important to protect ourselves. That means you as dentist, as your dental personal, and the patient. So I would like to thank you very much for attending this webinar. I would like to invite you to to attend more webinars at our Ivocla Vivident Academy, as you can see here. Um, either you take a QR code, a picture of that QR code, or it's ivoclavivident.com slash academy, where we have a bunch of live webinars every week. And in addition, you will also find recorded webinars uh, that you that are available to you on demand. Also, this webinar will be uh, published on demand. So maybe if you uh, dropped in a little bit uh, later, you can still watch this webinar. So thank you very much for attending this webinar. Uh, stay healthy, stay happy, and stay tuned. Bye-bye. <laughs>